Now let me ask you a question. Do you know God personally? I'm not asking if you know about Him. <laughs> you might know about uh, George Washington. I'm asking, do you know God personally? Is He today, this moment, in your heart, in your life, a bright, living, vital reality? If so, you know the deepest pleasure. You have fulfilled the deepest need. You have attained that for which you were created to know God personally. Because, you see, worship is enjoying the presence of God. You need nothing more. You should settle for nothing less. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Would you be finding the book of Exodus chapter 33 as we continue our study on worship? If you were to give a definition of worship, what would it be? Is worship enjoying God? I believe it is. I think that worship is enjoying the presence of God. Just put it in a sentence. Worship is enjoying the presence of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, how to enjoy the presence of God. Now, folks, the more I study, the more I experience, the more I realize that that is the bottom line, the highest good, the most wonderful fulfillment, to know God intimately and to enjoy Him personally, enjoying the presence of God. Now, let me tell you some of the most frightening words in all of the Bible. They're found here in Exodus chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. What are the frightening words? God says, I'm not going with you. I will not go up in the midst of you. Now, let's get the background a little bit. Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments and instructions for the tabernacle. While Moses was gone, Aaron, his brother, led the people into a revolt against Almighty God. What Aaron said is, we don't know what's happened to Moses. He's been up there a long time. Maybe he's never coming back. We need some guidance. We need some help. We need some leadership. You people give me your bracelets and your earrings, and we will make a golden calf, and we will worship that golden calf. And that's what the people did. Just go back to chapter 32 and look in verse 4. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After that, he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, what happens is this. When Moses comes down off the mountain, he sees this, uh, this charade, this, this orgy, this, 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 this feast. Uh, they, they were... Uh, made themselves naked. They are uh, committing immorality. They're doing terrible, horrible things, dancing around a golden calf. Moses is so grieved that he takes the Ten Commandments and casts them to the ground and breaks those tablets of stone. Then he takes that golden calf and has it ground into powder and mixes that powder with water and makes the people to drink it. And their, their, their greatest uh, delight now has become their greatest displeasure. And then 3,000 of the chief rebels are slain and put to death. Moses knows that this is a crisis. 
So Moses goes to God to intercede. And look, if you will, now in verses 30 and 32, chapter 32, and begin in verses 30 and 32. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Moses goes up to stand between God and judgment. He goes up to intercede. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, it's, it's sort of an unfinished sentence. His heart is just broken. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. And Moses is praying and interceding and putting himself in the place of these people. Now, after this intercession is the text in Exodus chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. Uh, God says, all right, I won't destroy them. All right, I'll not destroy them. Uh, Moses, for your sake, I will bring them into the land. I will give them an angel escort. I, I will... Uh, Give them protection. I will give them provision. I will fulfill my promise. But I will not go with them into the land. Now, look up here and let me tell you something, folks. If you're a brother and sister in Christ, do not settle for a deal like that. Do not settle for protection. Do not settle for provision. Do not settle for a promised land without the presence of God. Just don't do it. Now, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you have the presence of God, you need nothing more. But you should settle for nothing less. What made Israel different from the other nations? It was the manifested presence of God in the midst of them. It was the Shekinah glory. I wonder, are there some of you who once knew the glory of God? And now that glory has departed and that glory has faded and, and the glory of God is gone and your life is dry. What caused God to withdraw his manifested presence from his people? I want to mention four things. Those four things are the same four things that will rob you, denude you of the manifested presence of God in your life and will be the arch enemy of worship. Worship is enjoying the presence of God. Now, what were these four things? What happened to Israel where God said, well, I'll not destroy them. I'll send an angel, but I will not be in their midst. Number one, they disobeyed God. Look, if you will, in chapter, Exodus 32, verses 7 and 8 again. Go back to it, Exodus 32. And the Lord God said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Notice God calls them, Moses, your people now. <laughs> and notice verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Just underscore that. They have turned quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And uh, because they disobeyed God, the manifested presence of God was withdrawn from them. Now, I want to say something else. Do you know who it was? Do you know who it was that encouraged these people to disobey God and lose the manifest presence of God? It was Aaron. Do you know who Aaron was? Aaron was a priest, a religious leader. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. There will always be plenty of people who will give you a reason and excuse to disobey God. And it may even be a religious leader. They'll lead you into an unscriptural marriage, some immorality, uh, some, some, uh, some transgression of the commandments of God, and they'll say, well, that's all right. Times have changed and things are different. But I remind you one more time, that Jesus says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, if you want an angel escort, and if you want to go to heaven without having the presence of God in your life, that's your business, but I don't. I want the manifested presence of God in my life. 
I need nothing more. I will settle for nothing less. So ask yourself this question if, if God is not real to you. Ask this question in your heart this morning. Have I rejected a direct command of God? Am I living, am I right now living in disobedience to a known command of God? If you are, there is no reason that I can think of in all of the Bible where you ought to have a sense of the manifest presence of God. God loves you too much to manifest Himself to you in glory and joy and yet have you to live in disobedience because I cannot think of a worse lesson that He would teach you. So question number one, can I discern any direct disobedience to God? Let me ask you the next question, if God is not real to you. Can I discover any divided devotion to God? Not only direct disobedience, but divided devotion. Look again in chapter 32 and uh, look if in verse 4. And he fashioned them at their hand, and, and he received them at their hand, and fashioned it, that is the golden calf, with a graving tool. After that he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel. Now what had these people done? Uh, they had divided devotion. They claim to be Israel. The word Israel means the people of God. And yet they made a golden calf. They made for themselves a God that was no bigger than their own imagination. And then rather than trusting Almighty God, they began to trust the work of the hands. This was idolatry. As I've told you before that the Bible says when people make an idol, they become like the idol. First the man molds the idol, and then the idol molds the man. What is an idol? An idol is just a magnified sinner. A man just takes his own ideas and, and, and puts them into the work of his hands, and then he begins to worship it. And what he is really worshiping ultimately, therefore, is himself. You say, well, Adrian, I'm not guilty of idolatry. Well, let's check up and find out whether you are or not. Maybe there might be a golden calf in your life. What is an idol? Anything that you love more than God is an idol. What is an idol? Anything that you fear more than God is an idol. What is an idol? Anything that you serve more than God is an idol. Uh, anything that you trust more than God is an idol. Now, friend, there are certain relationships in your life that are wonderful relationships, but none can take the place of an undivided relationship to Almighty God. Idolatry is the mother sin, the father sin, the sin of all other sins. Now, here's a third question that you might ask yourself. If God is not real in your life, if you do not have that manifested presence of God and worship is enjoying the presence of God, do you, thirdly, detect any displaced dependence? Direct disobedience, divided devotion, displaced dependence. Look, if you will, again in verses 7 and 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They made them a molten calf. All right, there you have direct disobedience and divided devotion. Now watch this. And have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now they begin to put their dependence in the work of their hands. Their ugly God that they've made with their own hands. And now no longer is their dependence upon Almighty God that brought them through the Red Sea. You know what happens when you do that? When God gives you a victory and you give the glory to something else or someone else and then depend upon that rather than the God who gave you the victory, you're going to lose the presence of God. And when God gives you a blessing, and when God is good to you, 
and God brings you through the storm, whether it be desert storm or any other kind of a storm, and then you have that displaced dependence, you begin to give credit where credit is not due and fail to give God the glory, is it any wonder that His presence is not real in your life? Is there any direct disobedience? Is there any divided devotion? Is there any displaced dependence? One last question quickly, and I'll close this message this morning. Is there any determined defiance? Listen. Look, if you will, in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. What does that mean? Stiff-necked is the opposite of being meek and pliable. God was wanting to lead them, but they're like a horse with a stiff neck who rears up, who will not yield. You want God to be real to you? Don't be stiff-necked. If God gives you a specific revelation, God speaks to you about what He wants you to do, then obey Him. Has God told you there's somebody He wants you to witness to? Has God been laying somebody on your heart and you're not witnessing to that person? No wonder God's not real to you. Has God been putting some impulse in your heart to serve in this church, perhaps to work in the preschool, the nursery, perhaps to be a youth worker, perhaps to work on the parking lots, perhaps to serve in the kitchen? But you say, I don't want to do that. Has been, God been laying on your heart something He wants you to give? Some sacrificial gift, not even to a need, but for the glory of God? Has God been laying on your heart somebody that you need to go to and apologize to and reconcile with and make things right? Has God been telling you there's a relationship that you're in that you need to break off, young lady, and get out of it, or young man, that it is a wrong relationship? Has God been speaking to your heart and calling you into missions or full-time Christian service? Has God been telling you to do something, go somewhere, be something, give something? And you have said, no, you've had a stiff neck. And then you say, I wonder why God is not real to me. I wonder why God says, all right, I, I'm going to take you on to heaven. I'm going to give you an angel escort all of the way. But I'm not going in the midst of you. Thank God Moses had enough sense to say, no deal. He said, God, if you don't go with me, I ain't going. I am not going without you, the manifest presence of God in my life. What is worship? Singing songs? No. Saying prayers? No. Coming to church? No. Giving money? No. Worship is enjoying the presence of God. Is God real to you? He wants to be real. Again, Jesus said, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Lord Jesus, manifest yourself to Bellevue. Be real to us. Amen? Amen. Let's bow in prayer. While heads are bowed, no one stirring, don't gather your books. As you've listened this morning, have you discovered any direct disobedience? Have you discerned any divided devotion? Have you detected any displaced dependence? Have you displayed any determined defiance? Well, these people found grace long ago, and so may you. As a child of God right now, why don't you say, Lord Jesus, I want you to manifest yourself to me. And if I have disobeyed you, willingly forgive me. Lord, if I love anything more than you from now on, it, you will be number one in my life. 
Lord, if I'm trusting the work of my own hands or my own ingenuity, I quit it right now. And Lord, if there's anything you want me to do, I'm available. Here I am. And now, Lord, as I go, go with me, Lord. Go with me. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll seal this to our hearts. Amen.